Hey guys, what is going on? It's Alexander Williamson here with Fish Tree, your weekly dose of fish news. Have no need, you don't need to look at my ugly mug anyways, uh, you can just listen to these. That is the magic of fishery, exclamation point. So I hope you guys on the Aquatic Morning Show that are tuning in are doing well. Same to my other listeners, whether it's future viewers or whether it is those of you who make fishery possible, the members uh, who help from just $1.99 a month, you guys really make this channel a reality. So thank you so much for supporting this. So today we're going to talk about the grass puffer fish or uh, basically the puffer fish you'd think of from Japan that is poisonous. The uh, One of the varieties that they serve there as uh, so-called fugu and how they've realized uh, at a university that these puffer fish are using their own toxins that normally would be uh, harmful and deadly, in fact, to humans. They're using those in a new way uh, that we did not realize they could uh, by communicating with them. They're using them to talk to one another uh, chemically. So these fish are a delicacy in Japanese cuisine. The puffer fish or fugu also contain lethal toxins and improperly prepared the puffer fish can cause a person eating it to experience food poisoning and in fact swift death especially in some of the varieties that are most uh, coveted so such a terrible event can happen because the fish's liver and ovaries contain a powerful neurotoxin called tetrodotoxin or TTX however though it is a kind of unclear molecule why it's in the puffers um, puffer fish also have a bunch of other analogs of this TTX toxin and they are non-toxic so now a new study uh, published in the scientific reports uh, researchers of uh, Nagoya University in central Japan have proposed that puffer fish use these analog toxins to make communication signals and that they sense them smelling one another. So the grass puffer or takifugu albo uh, plum bayus, the grass puffers are a problem for many Japanese recreational anglers and are considered bycatch that uh, eat the bait fish that fishermen on traditional fishing lines often are going for plus they also can chew right through the line go fish uh so people are also known uh for gathering uh these puffers and drying them out they're known for eating them and they're known for uh actually bringing tourists to japan where they come into these shallow areas uh, during the high tides in the early summer months and they spawn by the tens of thousands. So since childhood, associate professor uh, Hideki Abe from uh, the Graduate School of Biocultural Sciences in Japan was delighted by these little fish. He grew up with them uh, spawning nearby and being in the culture. And uh, as a biologist, he was intrigued by their spawning behavior. And he said, I was fascinated by the hypothesis that their toxin may be involved in their spawning uh, as a pheromone because they actually detect the toxin and some of its uh, byproducts in water when they're spawning it and so it's been wondered like is it safe to be in the water nearby when they're spawning uh, and things like that so in the past they've tested the water and they've seen uh, the pheromones uh, and toxins are in the water and some of them are novel just to the fish Others, uh, they couldn't tell if they were environmental or if they were going to end up being specialized to the fish also. So they wanted to sort that out. And pheromones are chemicals that are perceived by creatures using their oral factory senses and are used to affect behavior within hopefully only that same species, although that's not always true. But like other fish, the grass puffer accumulates neurotoxin, uh, TTX, to discourage predators evolutionarily. However, the grass puffer also accumulates that non-toxic set of analogs, um, including TTX 5, 6, and 11 uh, tridioxy TTX, or 
TDT 5, 6, and 11. That's way too hard to say. So we're just going to say an arrangement of toxins. So scientists were curious as to why they would have this non-toxic version of the venom. And to better grasp this uh, phenomenon, a team at Nagoya University, uh, led by Dr. Abe, um, with his group of grad students uh, at the Biocultural Sciences Institute, investigated the compound. They established that it serves as a smell that attracts other grass puffers. And they uh, also established in the same study, so it's a pretty big study, that they use senses uh, in their oral factory nerve uh, complex to do that. So researchers tested grass puffers using electro uh, electro tool factogram, a device that measures excitations of the oral factory epithelium tissue in the fish. So it, it basically shows how excited they are and what parts, uh, what nerve signals are being sent to the brain, essentially. Uh, and surprisingly, they discovered rather than responding to the toxic uh, TTX, the puffer fish oral factory epithelium responded to its non-toxic dialogue. So the toxic one actually had no effect. It didn't, sm it didn't smell the toxic one. And so it implies that it, it has evolved as an odorant uh, and it is used to attract other puffers and that possibly the ones that just happened to have the most of these byproducts at the time in evolution uh, evolved to have the poison. Uh, rather than the poison evolving uh, first, it would be that they evolved this uh, cologne, so to speak, or perfume first, and one of them happened to be poisonous. And so the fish that had that survived better. So the, the level of it being made um, was increased. Now, the other part of the study saying that they were able to uh, figure out that they could smell this stuff was uh, kind of cool too in that they used earlier studies um, and they they figured that this toxin was derived from living organisms and they thought that it had a low purification uh, and they said that we assume that it may, may not only contain TTX but other analogs including TDT uh, which might have induced the odor response so they think that they may actually eat certain uh, mildly venomous things or at least animals with precursors to the venoms and then they digest it and they are able to process this into a new chemical. So prey animals contain both the toxin and its analog so grass puffers may use the smell of TDT as a signal to find prey um, animals bearing TTX such as flatworms, starfish, gastropods, and skeleton shrimp. So basically, they're saying that not only is it a pheromone for them to say, hey, there's a big school of uh, single eligible bachelors, but that they're, uh, or bachelorettes, but they're also able to then smell it on the animals they need to be eating. So they actually may be almost like aroused or uh, the same part of the brain that, that makes them think, ooh, mating time is triggered when they're eating these animals that have the toxins in them. So that's what causes them to seek out these these things specifically is that it shares a mating signal pheromonically, uh, which is really, really interesting. And they, they also said that, you know, they were able to reproduce this in the lab and... Uh, see that that they would come to fish that released this smell they could get it to come to in inanimate objects and things also uh and the fact that it evolved kind of as a way to mate but also as a way to stay venomous is really fascinating it's it's kind of like a i don't know greek tragedy or poetry of some sort maybe a haiku let's say it's it's like a well-balanced haiku um, and so it's just really interesting to see what they've made of that. And then, of course, these toxins are really interesting to study because they have all sorts of implications for targeting 
uh, different sorts of tissues and cancers and being anti-venoms and things like that. So there's all sorts of uh, medical uses for venoms and toxins in the wild, especially quick acting ones like, like these. So I thought this was kind of a cool story. There's more you can read up about it. And this was a really, really comprehensive study since they had a huge team of grad students that were all working on it. Uh, and I don't know, I thought it was exciting. And of course the first one of the, the week has to be the long one. So, uh, there you have it. Puffer fish are probably aroused by what they eat so that they stay poisonous so that they smell good to their mates who are also the most poisonous. Kind of a crazy, uh, feedback loop that has caused them to evolve more and more toxic, uh, and also keep eating those things that allow them to be toxic. So really cool, and uh, if your puffer's not eating, maybe this is a way to get it to eat, is uh, putting a little bit of those non-toxic traces onto the uh, food. So uh, they were saying that sometimes they can't get their puffers to eat in captivity, and there's a side note of that. But in any case, uh, that about wraps up this episode. I hope you guys are off to a great start this week, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye. What's going on, everybody? We are on episode 165 of Fishery. So thank you for letting this show continue as crazy as I may be. be, be it may be. We may be. Okay. All right. So episode 165. Dozens of new fish have been classified and discovered this month. So I'm just going to give you a little sampler because there's a whole bunch of saltwater ones. But I want to stick with freshwater because... It's all about me, and I like fresh water. Uh, so, the taxonomic review of vampire catfish genuses came out, uh, which talks about Paracanthopoma, uh, and uh, originally named by Professor of Ichthyology, Dr. Uh, Gilte, <laughs> G-I-L-T-A-Y, not guilty, uh, in 1935, uh, a group of Siliforms and Trichomycitiridae, sorry guys if I stumble over some of this Latin, uh, is originally described uh, a few different species of the uh, Vandalianae um, or Candiru fish. Well, now it has been revised, and instead of three species, now they are have a total of nine and so you can now have nine species to fear crawling up your uh, naughty bits instead of <laughs> just the three. Uh, there are nine, but luckily they're not, you know, popping out of the woodwork all over the place. These are the same fish we knew existed. They're just realizing that there are differences in the subpopulations. So on the next part of our list. We have a new and beautiful killifish out of Africa, the Aphiasmion uh, lori, totally butchered that, killifish species from the Wile River in Equatorial Guinea, and uh, the Aphiasmion, ah, man, I'm butchering that, Aphiasmion, Aphiasmion, Aphosium, you killifish people are going to kill me. Uh, <laughs> definitely really pretty fish, and uh, it is definitely uh, going to rival the Blue Galaris in like how vivid it is. It is really a, a crazy, surreal, uh, just mismatch of every color you can imagine, basically, and has that kind of same body form as a lot of the other uh, killifish that we do know of, but they keep finding new ones with little subtle color differences, and uh, the New World also has a new killifish just discovered, the Juan, uh, Juan der Bayanensis, a new species of killifish in the genus Moyama, uh, and uh, the Rivu Rivulidae, uh, the Rivulidae suprinodontiniforms uh, from the Pyrea watershed in southwest uh, Amazon basin region uh, is where they found it, and it was published in the Neotropy Journal. Uh, so you guys should just read that and the link to that if you guys are curious. Uh, the Neotropy Journal puts out a lot of neo-new uh, tropy uh, names and things for 
fish, new discoveries, new taxonomy stuff for uh, creatures, and, and a lot of it is fish. So uh, the base color of this fish is like, it starts up at the head, and it's red, and then it goes to an orange or peach in the midsection, and transitions to a soft peach tone by kind of that middle area, and then into the tail it fades to more and more yellow, while the undertones glow this like canary yellow hue on the margins, almost like a semi-translucent fish. So this killifish is then speckled with spots in colors of crimson and gold, and it has all electric canary yellow paired fins, it's pectoral and pelvic fins, uh, anything below the lateral line, those paired fins, are like bright, bright yellow. So from the underside, it's bright, bright yellow, which maybe mimics other what other fish would see looking up in tannic water um, on a clear day, like bright yellow. Could be that it's a form of camouflage. But then from the side, you can see that its tail has this beautiful iridescent blue and red cross hatching pattern on the caudal fin uh, on that tail and the tail section and it looks a lot like a crebensis or nanochromis where it's kind of like a woven uh, combo of blue and red and then again more detail on that reddish head is there's then a soft turquoise green uh, double band near the eye and then there are two more bands next to it that are crimson and both of those are iridescent or kind of like metallically um, reflective bands all set against these crystal blue stunning eyes. So it's a really pretty uh, fish and unfortunately it's only around for one season and then vanishes. But super cool. So also they found a new smooth skinned Laotian loach. Laotian loach. Laotian loach. Laotian loach. All right, I've done my vocal warm ups. Uh, and they found five new small dojo looking catfish in South America. So uh, the uh, scleronema and the uh, uh, plesoscleronema uh, uh, generas or genuses uh, are what these catfish are in. And there are a total of f uh, five new ones. And then there was an existing one that will remain. It's just these five have been split out of it, basically. Uh, and there's the Aromaculontum, and then there's the Pleso, Plesocyces scleronema, there's the Trichomyces ceramina, there's the Trichomyces tyramina, and then there is the uh, Trichomytyridae. Uh, that have been discovered, which to me, it's all Greek or Latin, actually. So also they found a new L series Pleco. It looks like a flattened version of an Ancestress uh, with three unique sets of plate armor protecting it, as well as onodontodes all over the front edge of its pectoral fins, which are large. It's like one of those butterfly Plecos where its pectoral fins spread out very large when you look at it from above. And it's got onodontodes on its face, but also uh, not huge ones, but it's got a bunch of tiny ones all over the front of its, like, fin, uh, not on the back side of the fin, which is really odd looking. It almost looks like a weird 70s hippie fringe jacket or something like little Nas would wear. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I was thinking about that, and then I was like, okay, so what if they named it after Little Nas or Elton John or something? So if they named it after Little, little Nas, uh, they would add two eyes to that. And so it'd be Little Nas, oh, there's a problem with that. It's a little German and nuremberg -y, 1930s sounding. So they probably won't name it after him. Maybe it'll be the new Laura Carraday Elton John eye. Uh, or something like that. Who knows? Uh, or or uh, Freddie Mercury. I uh, I think we need more rock star Laura Carraday, considering I don't think there's any. All right. So uh, they also uh, have found the Hartia canestra, a new uh, and I'm probably saying that wrong, but Hart Hartia or Hartia. Uh, it's H-A-R-T-T-I-A, -T -T and it's in the Loricaridae uh, siliforms order, but uh, they, they also found a new species there in the Rio Sao Francisco Basin. 
Uh, and so they've got two new lore Caridays that didn't exist before, which is pretty cool. They weren't broken out of formerly existing species. So I think that's cool. Um, so that's what I have to say in this episode. Said it really poorly, so you'll have to forgive me. I'm going to have to get someone, uh, some hooked on phonics for this, uh, for, for reading this stuff. So, uh, all right, guys, I will see you later. I hope you have a good one. Take care and back to you, Jess. Bye. All right, guys, what's going on? We are on episode number one, city six, and there is a new and free. Did I say that right? Is that true? Free book on Pantanal fish and Pantanal plants, and Pantanal biotopes. And it is full color with incredible write-ups. In fact, Ivan Mikolji, one of my good friends, uh, is credited with most of the pictures, uh, which are always phenomenal. His 30 years of taking pictures on the Orinoco and elsewhere. Uh, but they've got just talking about the Guianan Shield and the Pantanal, and they're talking about what this, what a weird place it is. Basically, it is a new um, area for collection, somewhat in that it is basically a, a, a savanna, and it's dry and grasslandy, and then there's these watering holes, and a lot of them stay fed by springs and things year-round. Springs and things. The new store where you can get all your springs and things, uh, where they are kept year-round uh, with fresh water. And so all the animals go there, as well as the predators. So there's things like caiman and jaguars and stuff, uh, as well as just lots of really cool fish that are kind of in this lost world that's divided by this kind of mountain range from the rest of the Orinoco or Amazon regions uh, to the south so uh, and west. So uh, it is a free book, uh, and you can download it. And for my members, I've got a link. Otherwise, Google it, y'all. Uh, that's what you get for a buck ninety nine. The satisfaction of just having to click a PDF file. Uh, I did the work for you guys, so uh, can't say I never did nothing for you. That's really all I have for today's episode. So uh, I think I'll spend the next five minutes uh, rehearsing the Gettysburg Address in Latin to make up for what I did butchering the last. E no, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. Uh, yeah, it's just going to be a nice, short, neat, tidy episode. So check that out. If you're one of my members, they'll be linked in the community tab with the rest of Fishery uh, sources and info. And if you're not, uh, Google it. Look up Pantanal P. PDF or um, Fish in the News, Twitter, they've got a link. Um, I'm already doing the work for you guys. See, I can't help but give. I give and I give. Uh, that's what I'm here for, though. All right, guys. Well, I hope you have a, a good day. Tomorrow's going to be a longer episode because we're coming back for those eels in the Sargoso, Sargasso Sea, uh, which I have been told is how you say it. Uh, and we are going to talk about why pollution is a problem for them. So uh, kind of interesting follow-up to last week's episode about where in the heck do eels come from? Already we figured out, oh, okay, this is where they come from, and this is why they're all dying. Uh, so we're going to go over that tomorrow. So I'll see you tomorrow. Have a great day, guys. Bye. All right, what's going on, guys? To finish out the week, we're going to do an eel update. So you know how we talked about European eels and how we couldn't figure out where they bred. Well, it turns out that they actually breed or spawn in the Sargasso, Sargasso Sea, um, which is kind of off uh, Bermuda out in the middle of the Atlantic. And basically they swim all the way from European waters, creeks and uh, brackish waters and estuaries. And they go into uh, the open ocean and the uh, Mediterranean in some cases. Then they head to the Azor Islands, make a stop there, get nice and fat, get huge, bigger than they do in Europe, and then all of a sudden they take off on a 6,000 kilometer journey to the middle of nowhere where they decide to spawn with each other in mass. And then they have these little tiny larval babies that are like less than a millimeter in size, yet they have a ton of them. So 
It's kind of an interesting reproduction pattern. And we also mentioned that since 1980, the amount that are returning to Europe has decreased 90%. Now, for a long time and into the 1980s, these eels were harvested and being sold as, as food in Europe. Uh, historically, they were eaten in Europe. And in fact, um, these eels were kept as pets um, because they lived a long time when they weren't allowed to return and spawn. So they they kept them as pets even back in the Roman days when they were a delicacy for food. They were kind of a status symbol if you had like an albino one or a black one rather than the color they kind of typically come in, which is like a grayish and brownish tone, um, with sometimes with speckles and stuff. Sometimes they're black, though, natively in some collection points. Uh, if only those Roman emperors knew that, you know, the Nordic ones were uh, much darker. They would have been rich with eels. Anyhow, these eels have proverbially, proverbially come home to roost. And it turns out that when they started looking at the eels that made it almost to the spawning grounds that were mature females, they they put them in a CT scan and MRIs as well later, um, two different studies. And they found that they were very, very uh, high in heavy metals. So everything from copper, cadmium, magnesium, manganese was in there too in levels it shouldn't be. And uh, also in some cases lead uh, and even, um, oh, mercury. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, so basically all the good things that were in paint chips around 1905. Uh, arsenic is another thing that they detected in some of the tests. Now, these eels go through a crazy transformation when they swim across from the Azor Islands off the coast of Africa uh, and the Canary Islands, and then they swim across the ocean. And when they do that, they're kind of like salmon in that they know they're going to die when they get to the spawning grounds. And so when they get there, all they care about is reproduction. And so the females actually turn their skeleton, their muscles, and their organs, including their esophagus and intestines, into uh, eggs, into ovaries. So they are basically a giant sack of eggs, of all these tiny little eggs, which most won't survive. And some will catch the current back up into the Icelandic area, and by that time they're like little teeny wigglers, and then they make their way back to Europe by the time they're tiny little fish. Uh, and not so tiny little fish depending on where they stop and where their end grounds are anyways so what's killing them was it that we harvested them and their life cycle is so long and it, it, it depends on four generations out and each generation is staggered in spawning by four years and it's 18 months of swimming between uh when they make it from the azores to the spawning grounds so for 18 months they're not eating they to cannibalize their entire giant and strong body, their five foot long body or whatever, and they absorb it into being a giant tadpole full of eggs, essentially, um, and just the muscles to slither across and to go with currents. Well, when they do this, it then takes all the nutrients out of the skeleton and the bones, and that's where usually these heavy metals would be stored and would be a problem for things that eat them, like humans, historically, uh, as well as all sorts of other animals. But they find that when the babies are born, they're gaining muscle. So somewhere along the route, they're getting these heavy metals in their muscles and bones and fatty deposits, so like liver, kidneys, uh, and in their bone marrow. And so they were trying to figure out where, you know, when they essentially render down an eel and they see that there are a hundred times the uh, allowable content for human food in the eels, uh, they're trying to figure out, like, what is going on? Where are they getting it from? Is it happening just because they literally dissolve all that tissue? And if other fish did that, that would be the case as well. And so they're trying to figure out that mystery and also figure out are they picking up all these heavy metals going up the North American current and up through the Atlantic somewhere, Iceland or Northeast 
um, United States and uh, Canada off Nova Scotia or something? Or is it in their growing grounds in Europe where they spend their adolescence and part of their adult life? Or is it in the ocean everywhere? So that's still the mystery, but the fact that they are definitely synthesizing it and turning it into their ovaries and eggs in the females is bad news because it concentrates it just like a liver or other organ does. And it, in this very unique process that they use, it puts all those heavy metals into the new embryo and the eggs. And so the new babies are born with a head start from the last generation of those heavy metals. And if they don't destroy the genes uh, with free radicals and uh, oxidants uh, causing damage to the chromosomes and to the tissue, then they will certainly be very full of that stuff and probably mentally, uh, neurologically as well impaired because this is not stuff that's found in high levels in the natural ocean historically. Uh, it could be from oil spills and things. It could be from, you know, uh, industrial plants that are spilling things into the water or did a hundred years ago. So now they want to kind of retrace if there's any unique metals or um, isotopes of other things that are made in the pro by process of uh, metals and industrial goods and see if there's anything unique that they can fingerprint in those eels. Uh, so they need to start collecting a whole lot more eel bodies, uh, unfortunately, uh, which was a hard task to do in the first place. They only got six to wear their RFID chips across the water. Uh, and that's rough when it's a five foot long eel or four foot long eel. Um, you'd think you'd hold on to more chips, but then again, their body's going through a metamorphosis. So that's what's going on and it probably loses the collar or even sheds skin and all sorts of other things but that's the bad news and so definitely um i mean if we keep selling them to asia like the black market they're already a red listed species but if the black market keeps buying them as a delicacy in asia they're eating a whole lot of lead and cadmium and uh, arsenic and mercury and copper and manganese and magnesium. Magnesium being the only one that I wouldn't be too worried about. Uh, so, yeah, not good, but maybe people will stop eating them. And ironically, maybe it'll help save them if they don't all die from poisoning. So not the most optimistic note to end the week on, but I do greatly appreciate you guys ending it on a note with me. And hopefully your weekend will be much more positive than the Eels uh, terminal journey. All right, guys, I will talk to you later. Thanks again. And back to you with the Aquatic Morning Show, Jess. I'll see you guys later. Bye.